Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deborah Levine. I'm the director of the Harlem Health Initiative for the City University School of Public Health and Health Policy. Um, I, I am super excited to bring you part of our webinar series. Um, just know that this webinar is hosted by the City University uh, Center for Systems and Community Design as a part of the Systems Change Lecture Series in collaboration with NYCEO and the Harlem Health Initiative, the NYU City University Prevention Resource Center and the City University School of Public Health. We'll be presenting the findings of a qualitative research study on Black and Latino parents' perceptions on childhood COVID-19 vaccines. And as people are entering, um, today's webinar is, the title is, How the Middle Moves. And we are going to get some incredible information about uh, the work that has been going on by my colleagues, and I'm super excited. As always, um, we start with a uh, brief poll that I will ask uh, Priya to put up. And if you would take a few minutes as you are settling in to tap in and uh, tell us what brings you here today. Um, we always like to know who we are having conversations with. Um, and we're super excited to get a sense of how we can continue to better serve you. Please know that the recording today will be available uh, within a couple of days. And any questions that we don't get to, we will try to do a document or a small video answering those questions. Um, and if you have any concerns, any questions, anything that's unclear, please feel free to put it in the chat and we will be happy to address them. So it looks like um, we have 44% are coming from community-based organizations. We have following up with that. 43% are health professionals. We have some faculty, some students, some community educators, and some community members, and our faith community is also represented today. So I again want to thank you on behalf of the school um, and also just bring you greetings from our dean, uh, Dr. El Ayman El Mahandez. So we are super excited to launch this webinar and what I will do is turn it over to our presenters who will present and then open the floor for questions. Thank you very much and we will click that so that we will get that out of your way. Christina, do you want to begin? Um, welcome and thank you all for joining us. Excellent. Thank you so much, Deborah, for the warm introductions. And thank you all for joining on this lovely afternoon. Uh, my name is Christine Wang. I am a PhD student here at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. And it'll be an invigorating discussion today to unpack the findings of uh, the dynamics that we discovered in Black and Latino parents in making choices around their childhood COVID-19 vaccines for children 5 to 11 years of age. I'm going to turn the floor over to my fellow research colleagues, Katie Lynch and Dr. Emma Sweet, to do a quick round of introductions as well. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and taking time out of your busy schedules to um, participate in this webinar with us this afternoon. My name is Katie, and I am also a PhD student. I'm at the NYU School of Public Health, and I'm really excited to be speaking with all of you today. Hi, everyone. One last welcome from all of us. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Emma Sui. I'm an associate professor 
in the Department of Community Health and Social Sciences here at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. And we're just so um, delighted to have a chance to share what we learned through this project and to get a sense of your reflections and questions as well. So thanks for being here. Thank you both very much. Uh, so before we dive in, we do have an announcement for our Spanish speakers uh, who have joined the webinar under the premise that there would be translation services available. Um, so, um, buenas tardes. Si usted es hispanohablante, um, pero necesita la, los servicios de traducción, desafortunadamente no tenemos los servicios de traducción um, durante esta charla. Y por eso estaremos en contacto con ustedes. Um, si apunte su nombre y su correo electrónico en el chat, uh, les mandaremos más información para un, una sesión que viene pronto. Disculpe por este cambio y muchas gracias por su participación. So without further ado, uh, we will um, dive into uh, sharing with you these preliminary findings. And we will preface that uh, we anticipate more insights um, as we go through formal peer review and publication, um, but we're excited to share the floor with you today um, and dialogue around our initial learnings. As a collective community, we have all lived through the last three years of what um, has been a challenging pandemic um, locally, nationally, and globally. Uh, when we look and reflect back at our experiences as community members, uh, there are many emotions and memories and um, salient uh, experiences that we can harken back to uh, that stress the burden of disease in our communities. Um, in local New York City, we know that Elmer's Queens was one of the initial epicenters. Um, the Bronx, as well as pockets of Brooklyn were disproportionately affected. And what laid bare during the pandemic was um, deeply entrenched um, history of structural racism, systemic inequities, and the health inequities that we see and the outcomes that these communities have long faced. So if we look at the Kaiser Foundation's data, this is a cumulative look at age adjusted and race adjusted data on mortality rates among um, our white, black, Hispanic, Asian, um, Alaska Native American Indian and Pacific Islander groups. Uh, we can see here that there is a disproportionate burden faced uh, when it comes to the mortality rates among our Black, Hispanic, and Native American and Pacific Islander populations as compared to their counterparts. If we look at the trends longitudinally over time, um, the surges of Omicron and the other waves actually widen the gaps of not just the mortality, but also the incidence. And what these data do not account for are, are the many other surrounding implications of how COVID-19 has transformed our lives, but disproportionately affected those who have already been disadvantaged in our communities. And so to combat the challenges of disease burden and also the cascading effects of COVID-19 um, in the many realms and domains of our lives, um, the government um, as well as institutions and healthcare delivery systems have stressed the mitigation efforts around vaccination. Vaccine development was one phase, but once vaccines were made available, the uptake of vaccinations among our community partners has been a significant challenge. And we have seen here that longitudinal data starting from March, 2021 um, through the summer of 2022, um, highlight that the uptake was exceptionally slow among our Black and Latino participants and members um, in the early stages of the vaccine release. Only over time, we have seen a bit of narrowing and reversal of the trends, and particularly among the Latino and white trends. Um, however, it took some time for um, any of that to materialize. Um, and even so, there is still a lagging behind the um, highest vaccine uptake um, group, as represented here is the Asian American population. 
So overall, there is much to be studied and understood um, on what drives these trends, what slows down the uptake, and historically, because our Black and Latino participants and community members have been underrepresented in research, uh, we took the chance during the study to um, take time and really understand and discover together um, what learnings we could apply for future um, pandemic response. When we look at New York City's data, um, there is um, a series of publicly available dashboards on the New York City Department of Health and Mental Health's uh, website. And as of January 2023, um, the cohort um, by age that has the lowest vaccination rate are children under the age of 17. So unlike their um, adult counterparts, um, children vaccination has lagged significantly. And if we apply and superimpose the um, race breakdown that we observed in the previous slide, um, it is very likely that there are um, those patterns also playing out at the city, at state, and national levels as well. Um, we know for a fact that um, childhood vaccination will be very critical in combating the many effects of COVID-19. Um, although children have been less of a focus around COVID-19 vaccination because um, the disease burden has been less uh, pronounced, we know that there is multi-system inflammatory syndrome that has affected quite a few children. Um, there is long COVID and the complex symptomatology of it. We also know that social, educational, developmental milestones have been significantly, significantly affected by quarantining or remote learning. And so to that end, um, what role does vaccination play in ensuring that our children are kept safe and well and integrated in their overall well-being, while also ensuring that children as a significant demographic of our population um, mitigate the risk of transmission to their multi-generational households or community members themselves. So we'll transition to really thinking about what trust looks like when it comes to decisions around vaccination. Um, there are existing vaccine trust models that have floated throughout the literature and the levers that are presented are rooted in um, several categories. One would be the vaccine product itself, awareness around the product, the side effects, um, the impacts, the protections. Um, there are also trusts or gaps in trust around provider systems and the healthcare delivery system at large. And of course, um, trust baked into the larger policy environment and how people respond to the way policies are implemented. Surrounding these core three categories there are external levers of generalized levels of trust in society. Um, this could be impacted by um, historical traumas, um, institutional trust, influencers such as social relationships and networks, politicians, community leaders. So there are many forces at play here on what could influence an individual's given trust in vaccines. So the aim of this study was to have a series of semi-structured in-depth interviews um, to qualitatively assess what central drivers impact Black and Latino parents' decision-making about COVID-19 vaccinations, specifically for their five to 11-year-old children. Uh, we focused on those that constitute what we call the movable middle, and those are parents who are undecided or somewhat likely to vaccinate their children. This study was conducted about a eight months after um, the initial emergency authorization uh, was permitted for children of this age category. And so parents had a moment to think about um, their choices. And at that stage, were able to determine would they qualify in the movable middle space or otherwise be on the periphery of that bell curve. So in order to conduct our um, series of interviews, um, between the months of February 2022 through May 2022, um, the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health engaged our different networks here. Uh, we recruited by um, uh, promoting the recruitment screener through the New York Vaccine Literacy Campaign, the Convince USA Network, the Harlem Health Initiative Network.
So there were many community-based organizations downstream to these um, connection points that received a recruitment screener to assess for eligibility. And the criteria were as follows, um, that um, the individual identified as Black and or Latino, was a resident of one of the five boroughs of New York City, was a parent of a child between five to 11, and as stated, uh, belonged to the movable middle space, and of course was interested and consented to a semi-structured in-depth interview one time with the research team. Our interview questions during the Zoom-based um, online interview uh, were conducted either in English or Spanish based on our participants' language of choice. Um, the questions address participants' experiences during COVID-19, um, their longitudinal attitudes towards adult and child COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, the adult-related questions gave us a backdrop into how parents were approaching their child's decisions. And then overall forces around decision making, influencers, um, information sources, and the like. In order to analyze our findings, uh, we used a matrix driven rapid approach methodology. And there was a triangulation approach applied to making sure that our findings and thematic approach uh, was validated. So at glance, our participant demographics were as follows. We were able to recruit 24 participants and conduct individual um, interviews with each, 15 of which were English speaking and nine were monolingual Spanish speaking participants. Some of the key demographic points to highlight were that half of our participants reported an annual household income of under $39,000. Um, their households were constituted by more than one individual, um, considering that we are looking at the parent-child dyad here. Um, so at the minimum, we're looking at a household of two, but in most and all cases, um, there were other members of the household, and that led us to um, an income breakdown where half uh, reported less than $39,000. Um, this includes um, any public benefits, um, income from work, gifts, and so on. Another 50% uh, reported that they had public insurance, and all of them reported Medicaid as the public insurance, while one was duly eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. And then another 28.3% um, disclosed to us that they were uninsured. Um, a pocket of these uninsured individuals did access um, healthcare ser services through the NYC Health and Hospitals, NYC Care, um, which is a low to no cost um, support service for those who do not have access to uh, insurance coverage. Among our Spanish speaking participants, 55.6% um, of them self-disclosed about their undocumented status, which gives us a different glimpse also into the inaccessibility of public benefits and insurance coverage that we just described. Um, if we look at the breakdown here, 95% um, of our interviewees were um, identified as female and only 5% uh, were males. And the race breakdown uh, was that 30% um, self-identified as Black, 63% Latino, and the remaining was a combination. In terms of county distribution, uh, we had the most representation from the Bronx community, um, and then equally thereafter from Brooklyn, Manhattan, and a smattering from Queens and Staten Island. And while 63% uh, were employed outside of the home, um, near 38% were homemakers um, and had a very important role in uh, deciding decision making around household matters as well as their children's health and vaccination decisions. So before we delve into the breadth of our results, um, this is a visual of how our research team synthesized the vaccine trust model based on the findings from all of our uh, willing participants open sharing. So at the top, you'll see the overarching notion of structural positioning. 
our participants were very articulate and aware around their structural positioning, whether informed by their cultural identity, their migration stories, their documentation status, or how they perceive themselves in the context of how COVID-19 had influenced or impacted disproportionately members of their own community. Um, so this is a very loose but broad and critical um, understanding of how this entire vaccine trust model is framed and will continue to color um, our discussion. And based on individual structural positioning and their awareness of it, um, we saw that there was a direct impact to the access of information, to accurate information, and to um, individuals that could be delivery um, vehicles for accurate information. So that access to information could be a moderator for how individuals were processing this undercurrent of fear. Uh, we saw that parents repeatedly um, expressed their fear, uh, but not just around COVID-19 infection, but also the COVID-19 vaccine. So there was a bit of a split pathway there, um, but overall, every parent expressed that sentiment of fear and anxiety around this time of the pandemic and navigating it with their child. So the natural behavioral response to that was a parental instinct to protect their child, either from COVID-19, the COVID-19 vaccine, or perhaps even both. And how they navigated to decide around vaccination was very much um, influenced by their engagement with supportive conversations that were built on trust. So in the middle, we have a social ecological model um, that tiers the individual, interpersonal, and the structural and institutional levels of how supportive conversations and trust building happen or do not happen, and how those moderate the way that parents process um, their, their split path of protecting their child by vaccinating or not vaccinating. So over the next few slides, uh, we will um, break down each of the tiers of the social ecological model um, to understand some of the uh, words verbatim from our participants and how that drew us into the vaccine trust model you just saw. So we'll start from the highest order here. Uh, much like our uh, participants were aware of their own structural positioning, uh, we did take a look at um, what structural and institutional um, roots um, sowed the fear and suspicion that they were experiencing? Uh, what were the implementation errors and messaging that ended up eroding institutional trust? So a quote from one of our English speakers, uh, one of our Latina English speakers, uh, writes that the US does not have a good history when it comes to medical innovations and breakthroughs and new vaccines. This was a pattern across most of our participants who reported that um, their recollection of US um, histor historical trends on uh, medical experimentation, um, lack of consent for conducting those innovations uh, really have scarred the way that they perceive the US's intentions when it comes to rollouts of new vaccines. Um, this pattern surpassed and transcended generational um, divides, time, language, and even physical boundaries and borders. So our participants referenced the Tuskegee syphilis experiments that happened here in our country, but they also referenced um, the syphilis experiments that happened in Guatemala in the 1940s as um, instructed by the US government. Um, so there is definitely a transference that happens across these borders and the stories that carry over even with migration, which was an interesting pattern for us to observe. The HeLa cells were also referenced, which is um, the contentious discussion around Henrietta Lacks and her cells that have um, been used for biomedical research um, decades even after her death from cancer. One of our Black English speaking participants um, alluded to the way that structural inequities at large influenced the environmental hazards um, that impacted her every day, as well as that of her child. 
Um, she stated, I'm actually waiting for an apartment to get fixed because that has contributed to him getting sick most of the time. It'll defeat the purpose of him getting vaccinated to come home to a house that is not fully safe. So there is a balancing act of what are the bigger forces that contribute um, to a lack of wellness and health. And this child had reportedly suffered from a severe case of asthma and was living in NYCHA housing and public housing here in our city um, with very limited maintenance and repairs happening with the mold and the pest issues in their home. Uh, leading to hospitalizations and the like. Um, so the downstream cascading impacts of how um, structural lack of safe housing uh, might be a contending risk um, as compared to even COVID-19, which might have paled to um, the risk at home. Um, this participant was um, clear about her awareness of their socioeconomic positionality and how that informed um, her decision making um, around vaccines. Among our Spanish speaking uh, participants, as stated, we had over half um, self disclose their documentation status. And again, the fear element was particularly stressed among this cohort. Um, in one of our Latina participants' words, um, she stated, parents are scared. Why are they scared? Because most parents don't have documents. They are afraid and they think that maybe if they ask a question about their address, they're afraid of being deported. So in her child's school, 85% um, are Mexican and of um, Hispanic descent, and most of them do not have documents. So any um, exposure of demographic information, engagement with the healthcare system um, was completely ridden with the fear of exposure and the risk of deportation, um, perhaps even separation from family. And another interesting uh, factor that influenced individuals' response to the structural elements of trust uh, was the implementation approach um, in New York City. Um, there was a $100 vaccine incentive that had been rolled out um, soon after the vaccines were implemented. And one participant, English speaking, stated, um, the fact that they were paying people to do it was so disgusting to me because that was aimed at people who need the money. So there was a mistrust and a suspicion, a deeply sown um, history of uh, why it is that um, people's healthcare decisions were monetized and how it is that, of course, those who are marginalized or socioeconomically in more need would be the ones responding to this and perhaps even uh, rolled up into um, this notion that this was a medical experimentation targeting those who had a financial need. Also at the structural policy level, we see here that um, our participants um, had many mixed emotions about the employer mandate um, that was uh, impactful to many in the workforce here, not just in the city, but also across the country. Um, this individual um, stated that I felt forced. I was very nervous. She felt uneasy, but it's done. What can I do? And that sense of resignation and the residual remnants unease, even after the act itself was completed, um, tells us that there's something to be reckoned with when when it comes to the um, perpetuation of mistrust based on these policy implementation rollouts. And we'll discuss the employer mandates in more depth as we go through our presentation. So as we move into the interpersonal level, um, there are social norms and uh, relationships that drive how individuals engage with their um, decision making. So in an environment where institutional trust has been thoroughly eroded, um, there's been structural exclusion, there's problematic public health messaging, participants often turned to their own firsthand observations, their own experiences, and um, really derived their own worldview around the vaccines based on their firsthand experience. So in one of our interviews, um, an English speaker stated, I needed more time to see how other kids after they took the vaccine felt and also to have the time to talk to some other people that I trusted. And this individual referenced her doctor and her older brother. 
So personal experiences became such a pressing theme for us in every interview. And that trusted primary data is what we saw as a reliance on relational trust. And you'll hear us talk about relational trust as the term utilized throughout this, um, this presentation. Wait and see was a mechanism that our parents used to protect themselves from um, navigating a world of uncertainty um, where they had to decipher through what was trustworthy or not, and they had to build their own sense of assurance on what observations could validate their decisions to proceed. In this case, one of our participants stated um, that their information is coming from other people's experiences. Um, however, that experience has not been great. It's not been great, not for themselves and also not in their neighborhood. And so we can see here that trustworthy observational data um, can move um, towards vaccination and also detract from vaccination. And there were some community-wide socialized perceptions around um, what the vaccine's role was and how it was perceived in that community. Um, in communities where there was a significant impact with employer mandates um, and the rush around the risk of losing their jobs versus getting vaccinated, um, there was that sense of coercion of being rushed and that sentiment among the adult community is what then trickled into the way they perceived their choice around the children's vaccines. An interesting element to explore here is that uh, one participant stated they had a very robust um, circle of friends of different demographics. Um, so stated all of my white friends, they've gotten vaccinated. So it just looks like my black friends are the ones who likely haven't done it. So that worldview composition, the process of culminating their own observations in the community and trying to unpack that is a process this individual was undertaking. Why is it that my white friends have done it without thinking twice while our black friends are hesitant? And how that puts that person in the middle of trying to understand their own choices. Now, when it comes to social norms, children themselves have a robust social life and with them um, being removed from school in their normal environments, um, parents felt a lot of um, push to want to engage their children in their socialization. Um, so one parent stated, I want her to enjoy time with her friends and have a social life because that too is important. So I don't want her um, to not be able to do events because she's not vaccinated. Um, so as stated earlier, it's not just about disease burden, but it's also about the social realms, the milestones, the developmental um, milestones, educational milestones, and the balance of life that overall the parents had to consider when making these choices. But this was certainly a motivator uh, for many of the parents uh, who wanted to make sure they didn't disrupt their children's social lives. Now at the individual level, um, we touched upon this in the overall framework, but um, choice at the personal level and the preservation of your own personhood and voice, as well as how that played out in um, deciding whether to protect their children from COVID and or COVID-19 vaccination uh, were the forces at play at the most intimate level here in the social ecological model. One parent stated, I'm an adult, so there's not much that I can change in my body, but they're still growing. Um, so the duty and the parental response to protect their child, the uncertainty of information as to how this will impact their child's growth and health over time against the novelty of this vaccine implementation uh, was a tension point for many of our parents. Parents also um, really wrestled with at what point it was socially acceptable. Um, and that too was a form of protection, especially if social health and social wellness was another domain uh, for consideration beyond just the vaccine itself. Now, 
parents did speak to um, how other mitigation strategies worked in tandem uh, with their decision around COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so how would they leverage um, the different mitigation efforts like distancing, masking, hand sanitizing before they went ahead and explored the vaccine or vice versa? Um, so all of these different mitigation efforts moved together to make the best decision in their perspectives around how to protect their child. Several of our participants also had to struggle with their child's individual medical um, considerations, um, asthma, ADHD, um, and autism were some of the conditions that were referenced. We had children that were going through diagnostic processes of trying to understand allergies and um, continued health needs. And so parents were unsure of how to navigate um, their medical needs. Now in that process, we were able to expose um, the variable range of experience with medical providers. Uh, many of our monolingual Spanish speakers had challenges with language access, um, with language concordant um, services, and um, even having providers that spoke Spanish. Um, for providers that did not speak Spanish, for our mon monolingual participants, um, there were translation services through um, interpretation devices or through live translators, um, but many admitted that those distilled and diluted um, the experience of being able to build rapport with their providers. Um, so having access was certainly an, an issue that we discovered and then further from that making informed healthcare decisions uh, was an item to um, unpack. Now, as stated, the individual was really wrestling with um, the movement of the different policy uh, changes. So as mask mandates were let down um, in the school systems, um, the parents suddenly had to reprioritize the way that the vaccine stood in their mitigation hierarchy. Um, so if one child coughs and the other has a fever, then suddenly the masks are not on anymore. And so the changing policy landscape prompted some parents to then further reconsider um, their child's push for vaccines. So overall, our parents are um, across the board in the boat of uh, risk assessment. Um, they're trying to process their own emotions, but really evaluating um, the risks at hand, um, but they're nested in this larger context and structural forces of policies, um, implementation efforts, and messaging. So based on our participants' feedback, um, there were some takeaways that I would say are the three tenets of how we can move forward into um, next stages. Uh, one, how do we preserve individual choice? And what do the dynamics of choice look like for parents and children? How do we honor people's uh, personhood and ensure that they feel a part um, in their decisions around healthcare and their well being? That is directly tied to how they perceive their place in society, um, in their positionality, in their perceptions of the world around them. Secondly, what are some ways that we can improve our transparent institutional communications that only improve trust and not take away from it? And what do supportive conversations look like? So this is just a revisitation of our vaccine trust model. So we've moved our way through the fear, the protective instincts, and now we're kind of at that, that stage of choice and the layers of what is driving that movement towards the, cho the choice to vaccinate. Children who were older had more of a say in influencing their parents' thought processes around the vaccine. Um, children, too, are in their own social environments. And at school, if they would hear their, their friends indicate that they were vaccinated, they, too, were interested. Um, if their friends took their masks off, they, too, felt some form of unspoken social pressure to take their masks off. And so children had their own sources of information, even their own cell phones for the older ones. And being able to um, engage with their child on what information they brought home was a really important glimpse into how our parents um, thought about their relationship with their children. Many felt that they wanted to be a different generation of parents where they gave space um, for their children's voices and honored their choices. So in this case, one of our English speaking Latina participants 
stated, if he will come up to me and say, mom, could I just go get my vaccines? She would say, okay, let's just go. And in some cases, we did see this pattern play out. Whereas in other cases, um, parents did a little bit of a dance, um, trying to maneuver around their, their child statements while also holding to their own hesitation around how to make the decision as the adult in the home. For the younger children, of course, parents were the, the decision maker and medical consenter for all things. In terms of transparent messaging, um, this was also a recurrent pattern, but because of the, the very deeply sown mistrust in institutions and government, uh, we found that um, this quote captures it very saliently, where um, the recommendation was that public officials need to be transparent and acknowledge that while we do know these things, we also don't know enough. This is new to us too. So if they can just acknowledge that, if, if I can hear it come out of, let's say, Mayor Adams' mouth, then I will be more trustful and be more, okay, I can believe them, I can give my child this. So this is one perception of how um, government and institutions could humanize their approach to acknowledge that while, yes, this is scientifically tested and while this is helpful and it mitigates risk, there's also the flip side of um, we don't know everything and we're still in this together. And as a collective community, uh, we can acknowledge that we're gonna go through this together. So I think because of their perception of positionality, having people reach their hands out and really be on the same side of the aisle with them and engage in that person to person um, humanistic engagement, um, we felt would be helpful for participants of um, participants in our in our study. So that was one form of a recommended um, conversation from a public office. Um, however, broadly speaking, uh, we saw that when there were parents that were in the middle, what ended up moving them at any point, even a smidge, uh, were supportive conversations, iterative over time, that promoted openness to the vaccine. So what do supportive con conversations look like? They reinforced um, the person's ability to choose, but at the same time, preserve the personhood of that person, um, the value of that individual, really hearing from them um, what their perspectives were and being able to artfully engage in that discussion while inserting that um, accurate vaccine information. Um, the supportive conversations were held in these cases by teachers, doctors, colleagues, and even community-based organizations that were influential in the communities in their neighborhoods. One parent um, said very clearly that the teacher um, said it was my decision that I could protect my child and be calm, that it is better to vaccinate her, but that it was my decision and they were there to support me. This is one quote of a very long segment where she describes that process and that it wasn't a one-time effort, but it was a iterative day-to-day -day engagement where the parents um, had an Im implicit and inherent trust with the teacher. And also their relationship is nested in a trusted environment, which is the school. Um, and they were able to work through this together um, by really reinforcing um, the value of the parental relationship to the child. In another case, our Spanish speaker a participant stated that um, the doctor who had been meeting with her monthly um, shared his own story that he wasn't sick or he wasn't dead, as people said, but he spoke with her in a very frank way for several months over time. And for her, it was like therapy. It was therapeutic. And over time, she was able to see with her own eyes, build that observational, uh, relational trust, uh, build her worldview around the vaccine, and ultimately move herself closer um, to vaccinating herself and her child. So in summary, um, based on the quotes that we were able to share with you, um, there are different barriers and facilitators for these supportive conversations. And again, access was a critical barrier, um, something that we need to evaluate as um, policymakers, as delivery systems, as providers, as CBOs. Um, and also really looking at vaccine mandates and the 
trickle down consequences of how mistrust is perpetuated uh, when public health communications and, and initiatives do not take into account the unintended consequences of their decisions. On the flip side, facilitators, again, are iterative conversations over time um, and leveraging um, the social networks, especially the ones in the intimate circles. Um, and we can label them as community ambassadors um, who would really carry empathetic and judgment-free conversations with our participants and members. Culturally relevant communications are very important given the diversity of our community um, and also the um, historical legacy um, experiences that people are bringing to the table um, and having fluency around those experiences would have been very helpful as well. So for future pandemic response, uh, we believe that there would be a, a significant boon to our ability to curb um, the misinformation and the mistrust by layering in a community ambassador model, uh, especially while mandates are being rolled out. Uh, we know that the mandate was critical for getting us to the outcome of increasing vaccination rates, but the throughput and the process and the journey of how people got there and what they walked away with in their lived experience uh, requires an intervention in a much more relational and scalable manner, um, which we have labeled here as a community ambassador model. In San Francisco, there was a community ambassador model employed um, among the Latino community. Um, so there is a model described here that we can replicate in different communities and settings where there is um, a multi-pronged effort and campaign um, to engage the community, whether through outreach, cold outreach, community-based organizations, or even again, lo local social networks of an individual's lives. So broad mobilization of community members is different from having community health workers localized as employees alone of institutions, but really opening the door to charging and, uh, and inspiring people to say that they play a role um, in um, moving people towards better information, accurate information, and promoting a judgment-free and safe space for discussion is something that we really wanted to highlight here as a takeaway because of the role of observational and uh, relational trust data. Social capital uh, was critical for us to be successful in this particular community in San Francisco and can be replicated as well in other communities across the country. So as we near the end of our hour together, uh, we do have a reflection question for you all on how might you apply these takeaways um, and findings in your life? Whether this is your professional life or your own personal life, um, how do these takeaways around supportive conversations, community ambassador models, um, the structural forces at play influence the way that you might take your next steps as an ambassador of vaccine promotion. So we'll give you a second to think and reflect, um, but we'll also take any willing and brave souls to volunteer to unmute themselves or raise your hand and our hosts will um, unmute you um, to share a segment about your thoughts. I see we have Avena raising her hand. Yes, hi, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. This is a very informative study. Um, I'm a community health worker and specifically working in a space within tree uh, zip codes um, uh, addressing COVID health disparities. So um, I definitely see some takeaways. I'm also seeing um, through this experiences that I've had um, as well. Um, because I re recall engaging two parents with very young children who did express, I, I just decided to ask them um, about it. What did they feel about it for their children? And they particularly expressed concerns with whether or not it could cause autism. And that sounds like something that was touched upon. Um, but I, I particularly love this presentation. It's very informative and it will definitely be so, um, something that I will use going far, farther in engaging parents and um, particularly in regards to their interest in whether or not they would 
have their children vaccinated or not, or where they are about it, how they feel about it, without any judgment, of course. Um, and that is something that I've already been doing. And I'm encouraged by this information. This is excellent feedback. Um, and I actually see where I can do more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we know that we have an army of people who are already um, so engaged in this mission to um, promote the vaccine and do it in such an empathetic and judgment-free manner, um, you know, meeting our community where they are. So thank you, Avena, for sharing your thoughts and uh, your reflections to continue further in your work. Any other takers um, to you wanna share your personal thoughts and your takeaways? While this is a loaded series and layers of uh, findings that we presented to you today, um, feel free to um, can continue to layer your own thoughts into this as we go through our Q&A section. Um, I believe we have another hand up. Oh, Dr. George Dawson will unmute you to share your thoughts too. Hi, so I'm a retired physician and uh, now our CHW with Ryan Health, formerly with the uh, DOH uh, Public Health Corps. And so I've uh, done quite a bit of work uh, in the COVID uh, work uh, with the vaccines for the past 24 months in the pots and now in the community, Central Hall in particularly. And what I have found is that uh, I think the vaccine trust is more related to COVID vaccine and not the other vaccines. And I've gone over hundreds of uh, records, medical records here at, at Ryan. And uh, these uh, families are getting their kids vaccinated with the routine vaccine. So I wouldn't generalize it as quote, vaccine distrust or whatever, but it's particular for the COVID vaccine. And, and that's just the reality of it. And number two in my experience, uh, based on the data, CDC or wherever, even in New York City data, COVID is really not a killer of kids compared to senior citizens, 50 and over. And so maybe parents are onto something with regards to COVID, provided they're not a intergenerational home, intergenerational home, and uh, if they are, that the older folks are vaccinated. To me, that would be the push in terms of COVID. But uh, just vaccine trust generally from the uh, people I've seen in Central Harlem and the, and the Washington Heights area, East Harlem, uh, the kids are getting vaccinated with routine vaccines. However, the, the COVID vaccine is an issue. And that, uh, to me, it's political how the rollout of the initial management of the uh, pandemic was formed by the uh, past political administration. Uh, the mistakes that were made at the CDC with the faulty uh, uh, COVID test. I mean, there's a lot of political baggage there. And so these parents are onto something. And I don't really, you know what I mean, fault them for that. And like I say, I think the, the saving grace is that uh, COVID really doesn't really impact kids from a mortality point of view to the extent that it does seniors, 50 and over, and unless the kid has a pre-existing illness, you know, immune suppressive illness. But in general, I mean, they get COVID, but they don't really, uh, you know, it's not really an issue for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dawson, um, for your work in the community and also for sharing your experiences. Uh, we did have a question during our interviews around um, parents' perceptions of other routine vaccines. And we did observe very similar um, patterns there um, that there was less hesitation around the routine vaccinations. And it was a time um, chronology and wait and see approach that was being applied. So if it's been standardized and normalized, socially accepted, um, tried and true in observation because they've all received these vaccines over the past few generations, then they didn't think twice critically about those vaccines nearly as much as they are doing with the COVID-19 and applying this wait and see approach by observing their own neighborhood children and school children's uh, reactions to the vaccine. Um, so we definitely echo what you've observed um, around the data. And certainly, while um, the disease burden is not as um, prominent for children as it is for our other age cohorts, uh, we 
do kind of understand the interconnectedness of um, children to their parents, to their schools, and also um, to the community at large. Um, so we we do reckon if the impact of the disease burden were higher or more severe for children as it is for adults, would this discussion be different? Um, so I think thinking about the broader framework of what are the many risks at hand and how do parents assess the different domains of risk? And is the COVID-19 vaccine a solution to the risk assessment uh, was what we had observed. So thank you for sharing your thoughts there. We have a raised hand from Bail. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you well, thank you. Okay, great, hi. Um, it's Bailey and I'm um, here from Seattle. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, I'm uh, attending from uh, far away from Seattle. I'm an um, outreach worker at a county hospital for immigrant refugee health around COVID and um, first off, I'd just like to say I've been on a lot of calls around multiple topics involving COVID, and this is probably hands down the best presentation I have um, been on in a very long time. So I just really appreciate all the work that's gone into this and um, how well you put all of the components together and, and how you kind of went step by step to explain all of this, because I think um, this is a really important study and, and topic in general. and um, it's just uh, great to see others thinking about these same things. Um, so thank you for that. And then um, one quick comment uh, that struck me during this presentation and something I've been thinking a lot about as we move forward into our, our third year of COVID um, is how the parents in a couple different places, you noted that the parents you interviewed had different health priorities for their children. And I think some of that is really tied to those structural issues, those societal issues that are a lot more difficult to, to resolve. Um, and some of them might be less, uh, less directly tied, but I think that's something really important and not, and something that isn't brought up enough is that it's not that, you know, parents don't understand health needs or things like that. They very clearly understand their children and their needs. It's it's just the priority in terms of, um, you know, non-health issues, set that aside, but even within the health, uh, direct health and health care um, for their children, there's other priorities, which I think is, is really important to consider, uh, especially where we are in the epidemic. So um, anyway, thank you so much. That was a really long-winded comment. I just wanted to say thanks. I uh, really appreciate the presentation. Thank you so much, Bailey, for your thoughts and um, really echoing the um, shared work that we are all doing to support um, ed education around vaccines and um, our community members in a way that is well received and supported. Um, your point about the different health priorities is a very important one because it really touches on um, the nuances to every individual's health care needs um, and how they are plugged into a larger system of care that can, cannot, does, or does not meet um, the specific medical and healthcare needs of that child. Um, so in our case, I, I would say the repeated um, pattern here was um, unawareness of how that condition of that, that child interacts with um, the vaccine and whether it was appropriate for them to get it at that time, um, at that age, um, given their medical treatment history. And of course, that overall structural hierarchy of um, having access to safe housing and being hospitalized repeatedly for asthma, um, is the vaccine really the appropriate solution when there are many other contending factors here? Um, so I agree that risk assessment at large, and we're talking about many of you are parents, I'm sure, and what you have to wrestle through and prioritize and deprioritize and lay out next to each other to make decisions that are in the best interest of the child is a loaded process. And it's certainly not a simple one. Um, so we wanted to give nuance to it. So thank you for, for sharing your commentary. I see we have a hand up from Jolie.
Billy, I think your hand went back down. Um, so I'll move on to Larry. Hi. First of all, I, I want to echo the sentiment just made. Wonderful study and, the, and, and wonderfully presented. I've been to an awful lot of bad presentations. 80-20 rule. This is a good one. You've done really, really well. I want to compliment you. Yeah. Uh, there was a study out of this 1960s, a long, long time ago, where they're looking at interventions. And they found if you got to a mom that had multiple kids, first of all, it not only be addressing the immediate child they were clinically concerned about, but it also impact the other children, but also made what I, in Rosen, to what I like to call the mommy mafia. It's the moms going to a playground, talking to the other moms. If you can get to a mom with multiple kids, she's going to be talking to other moms. And it's a good way to get some leverage. Number one. Number two, no dispute with the doctor's comment that kids don't get as sick, but to the extent that they get infected at all, they now can reinfect other people. So even though you don't notice it, it's a second order impact, it's a real impact. And number three, and this gets kind of nerdy, the moment of infection is the point where new variants are created. New variants are at that point of replication. As the number of infections goes up, the likelihood of new variants goes up. God knows what's going on in China, but they're not getting honest data, but it's all bad. Anything we can do that can lower the infection rate, even among kids who themselves clinically are not as problematic, is probably really good long term. Thanks. Thank you very much, Larry, for um, sharing. Uh, much agreed that there are so many outputs from a child, one person getting sick. Um, it's not just about that individual's illness, but all the cascading effects, downstream effects of it um, for the local community, for their own household and the like. Um, in terms of the comment about moms being a social network within their own group um, from the 1960s, I think that same concept applies, whether the social network is a group of teachers or parents and teachers or their local faith community or a CBO, wherever that person has identified their social trust um, that really becomes the space for it. Um, so we want to expand and broaden the definitions of what a community ambassador might be. Um, it might not be someone technically employed by a CBO or a healthcare organization, but how do we as community members um, take on that role of um, being diplomats or ambassadors of this information and supporting our fellow um, neighbors? And uh, I think we unfortunately had missed Jolie a little earlier. So Jolie, let's give you the floor um, to share your thoughts and comments. Thank you, and I'm sorry about that. No worries. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm actually a recent graduate student from Stony Brook University. And I just want to echo off of what everyone else had said about the presentation and like how eloquently you were able to um, just educate the findings and the research and the importance of implementing this into our communities because, you know, especially right now, it's just a topic that we really do need to understand more um, and just really put into our lives and have these conversations, uh, even within our families and our um, peer groups. Um, I think just one thing that I wanted to reflect on uh, in understanding how can I apply this, um, these findings to my life is personally, number one, how you mentioned in the beginning about understanding that the US did not have a good history for medical uh, innovations. I knew about the Tuskegee um, uh, syphilis experiments and the HeLa uh, cells um, tobacco in the past, but really this, I guess, cemented the idea of really understanding how history plays a role in our lack of trusting and wanting to do different medical innovations and being able to trust vaccinations. So one thing that I personally do wanna do is look more into other um, histories like how you mentioned the Guatemala, the Guatemala uh, syphilis and just understanding how does that background play a role in why many people in society may have, um, I guess, um, very hesitant about trusting these different things such as vaccines. And then also another thing that really stood, up, stood out to me about this is the fact that I want to go into the medical field in the future. And one critical component of determining whether someone wants to get vaccine is really building that trust and having that continuous relationship with someone who wants to get uh, vaccinated and understanding that it doesn't just take 
one day of telling people, oh, a vaccine is good, you should get vaccine. I mean, vaccinated is really about the many days and months, as you mentioned about some of the people that you spoke to, of having those relationships and really understanding how can it impact them, but also validating you know, their apprehensions and how um, it can play a role in between the relationships with a parent and a child. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jolie. It's great that we are in the midst of um, like-minded collective um, public health ambassadors here in this meeting. So thank you for that. Um, your point about um, historical traumas that affect our larger global community and being informed uh, and constantly educating ourselves on um, histories of past, but also how they um, continue to replicate traumas today um, is a really important one for us to consider. And I will say that um, those who had cited the Guatemala syphilis experiment were not ethnically Guatemalan. They were from the region, um, from other countries that surrounded Guatemala, but clearly there were reverberating impacts of how um, Latin Americans were perceiving their, their like geopolitical position um, against the United States. Um, and so these, this is fairly recent history and that is still playing out in the region there. So um, I really do echo your sentiment to want to expand our own boundaries and learning. So thank you for it. And um, all power to you as you go forward with your uh, medical training and your engagement. I'm gonna jump in just a moment um, to say that we're aware of uh, the time and everyone's time constraints. And we're so excited about the conversation that we've been able to have and Christine's excellent presentation of our study findings. So we'll take just um, maybe one more comment or question if there is one, and then we'll move toward wrapping up. And we're just so grateful to everybody for, for being here for this conversation and to think about how to move these findings out into the world to support the work that so many of you are doing. I see Dinah's hand. Hi everyone, thank you Christine uh, and thank you guys for organizing such a wonderful presentation to um, know the findings of the work that you have done. Um, I'm also a MPH, uh, I, every student, I took a class in um, Kenya and PH program as well. So I'm kind of familiar with, with this work. And so every time I see something um, this nature, I'm very excited that we're not only sitting in the classroom, but we're actually out there in the community, especially in Central Holland and it, its environs. And I am currently working with um, Black Health, National Black Leadership Commission on Health. And one of the programs or projects that we are currently working on um, with the University of Washington is um, One Vax, Two Lives, um, doing a needs assessment with women expectant and postpartum women um, and to find out their perceptions about the vaccine as it was rolled out and as how they feel about these vaccines. Uh, and so I'm very, very excited about this presentation. And I think a couple of things a um, couple of takeaways for me as we roll out. Um, I don't want to get to get an impaired judgment before we start the needs assessment, but I think these are very, very necessary, especially in our black and brown communities. Um, as we do the work that we do, educating community members and you know, in real time, um, wherever we find ourselves, making them, you know, building some confidence around this work, this public health work that we are doing, and not just only keeping the findings, but making them public to people like us who get to daily interact with community members. So thank you great so much, Christine, and um, the team for the great work. Thank you. Thank you so much, really, for um, the work that you're doing, because I think this session is our starting point just to share what we've learned so that we can all apply it in our different settings as public health practitioners and policymakers and providers. Um, so we are grateful kind of for your tuning in and leaning into this um, research. I want to say thank you. Um, it has been absolutely incredible. I told y'all this was going to be good and I thank you for coming and supporting us, 
uh, as we continue to center community and partnering with community to get the answers that we need uh, to be able to have a healthier, uh, more supported community. Uh, this recording um, will go out uh, with uh, along with the slides in a couple of days. So look out for that. It'll also be on our YouTube channel. Um, I wanna thank Emma and Christine again Thank you so much for bringing this information forward. Um, any closing thoughts? Thank you so much, Deborah, for the space. I think we are all in the work of creating equitable space. So um, we want to thank our participants. Um, they're the ones who took the daring and bold step to share with us their own vulnerabilities and their lives and their um, stories. And so we really attribute it back to them, our fellow New York City parents, um, and of course to our um, supporting agencies and organizations, um, as mentioned earlier in our presentation, um, for making this possible so that we can uh, refine and fine tune the practice of public health. So thank you everybody for your time this afternoon. And thank you. If you would please, before you go out, um, just finish our poll, it helps us help um, our faculty and students uh, know the kind of content and how uh, their impact and their work. Um, once again, I wanna thank you for trusting us with your time, your energy, but most of all, we wanna thank you for all that you do for our communities. Um, thank you very much. And um, we will see you at our next webinar in February, which will be um, looking at young opioid use and the impact. And you will get that link uh, in the email with the recording from this webinar. Thank you all again.